have come to the end of the book of Esther. And it's been so blessed to, to journey with you through this book. It was a bit longer than the book of Ruth, which was only four chapters, I think, yes? And we learned a lot in those four chapters, but we took it a, another step further in the book of Esther. And just the important thing to notice and see throughout these two books was how God's hand is constantly at work in our lives. Even when we might not see it or feel it or think that we are experiencing it, God is always there. He is always faithful. He is always true. And we've come to the end of Esther. And finally, as I've titled this morning's message, Victory and Fame. Victory and fame is ours. We see that the tables have turned. God has made his people victorious. Now we have all heard and used the word karma. And although it might have its, its history in Hinduism and Buddhism where it means something with, to do with reincarnation, over the generations it has been changed to mean something that you reap what you sow. You reap what you sow. And how the tables have turned for Haman and his family. Karma hit him hard. This reversal that has taken place over the last few chapters, we have to recognize that this has come only through and by the hand of God. There's no two ways about it. As much as um, Mordecai and Esther were the instruments that were used, they were simply the instruments that were used. God had used them for his purposes and his glory. Now, Bernie and I love going to, to watch and listen to the Cape Town Philharmonic Orchestra. We love the, the ballets and, and simply just sitting there um, watching the orchestra doing their thing. They're gifted. They are, are blessed. They are talented. I think we, we enjoy it so much because both of us were in the orchestra as well many years ago. And although these musicians are masters in their specific field, their instrument, they are gifted, they are talented in their specific instrument, they know their instrument so well that they can play without looking at their hands. They can play without looking and seeing what their fingers do. They know exactly where their fingers are, they know exactly where the notes are, they know what to do because they have honed and crafted their instrument. But one thing that you can be very sure of is that they will not play or even lift up their instrument to position until the conductor's hands have been raised. Position is where the violinist, sta violinist stands like this, ready. Or the cellist will stand ready. Or those with um, woodwind instruments would stand ready with the mouthpiece in, mouthpiece in their mouth, ready to go for it. They will not put their hands and their arms in the ready position until the conductor has raised his hands. Now they know the song. They know the song very well. In fact, in matric, I had to play my music without my music sheets. You weren't allowed to have them. You had to know your song and your music off by heart. So they know when to begin. They know where their part fits in. The poor triangle sometimes just gets one ting at the end of the song, but he waits that whole 40 minutes for his turn. They know exactly when to go. But... They will not go there until the conductor has raised his hands and pointed to them. We know the hand signals by now. When he goes like this, it means you play softly. When he gets all excited, like I sometimes do, they play loudly and vigorous. Forte, they would shout. That's what the music says. Loudly, vigorously. 
and fortissimo when you get super excited. They even appear squint at times. One eye on the conductor, one eye on the music sheets. Because they're waiting for his instruction and his direction. You see, God's hand was at work in Esther and Mordecai. You see, they were simply following the prompting of the Lord. When the Lord said, speak, they spoke. When the Lord directed them to move, to go, to, to approach the king, they did so. It wasn't out of their own strength, out of their own wisdom. They were simply waiting for God's direction. And it isn't mentioned in the book. In fact, you, you would know by now that God's name isn't mentioned in the book of Esther. Not once did they refer to God in Esther. But you see God's hands at work throughout the book. How God orchestrates everything. Now things have turned around for the Jewish people in the last couple of cha chapters in the book of Esther. And as we near the end of the story, verse 1 of our text is a perfect description of what has happened. On the 13th day of the 12th month, the month of Adar, the edict commanded by the king was to be carried out. On this day, the enemies of the Jews had hoped to overpower them. But now the tables were turned, and the Jews got the upper hand over those who hated them. I love that statement, the tables were turned. Things have changed. The one who was on the one side is now standing on the other side. Just when things were hopeless, God changed everything in the favor of his people. God has done the very same for us as his children. God has turned things around for us through his son, Jesus Christ. The tables have been turned. We are now victorious. Let me read from verse 2 onwards before I get too excited. The Jews assembled in their cities in all the provinces of King Xerxes to attack those who determined to destroy them. No one could stand against them because the people of all the other nationalities were afraid of them. And all the nobles of the provinces, the satraps, the governors, and the king's administrators helped the Jews because fear of Mordecai had seized them. Mordecai was prominent in the palace. His reputation spread throughout the provinces and he became more and more powerful. The Jews struck down all their enemies with the sword, killing and destroying them, and they did what they pleased to those who hated them. In the citadel of Susa, the Jews killed and destroyed 500 men. They also killed Parshandatha, Dalphon, Aspatha, Poratha, Adalia, Aredatha, Parmashta, you have to, Arishai, Aridai, Vazatai, the ten sons of Haman, son of Hamatata, the enemy of the Jews. But they did not lay their hands on the plunder. The number of those killed in the citadel of Susa was reported to the king that same day. And the king said to Queen Esther, the Jews have killed and destroyed 500 men and the 10 sons of Haman in the, city, in the citadel of Susa. What have they done in the rest of the king's provinces? Now what is your petition? Hasn't he given enough? God's favor is still there. Now what is your petition? It will be given to you. What is your request? This is the fourth time that the king asked Esther, what do you want? I think that's a husband that knows how the house works. Keep the wife happy and everything will go smooth. What is your request? What is your petition? It will also be granted. If it pleases the king, Esther answered, give the Jews in Susa permission to carry out this day's edict tomorrow also, and let Haman's ten sons be impaled on poles. So the king commanded that this be done. An edict was issued in Susa, and they impaled the ten sons of Haman. 
The Jews in Susa came together on the 14th day of the month of Adar, and they put to death in Susa 300 men. But they did not lay their hands on the plunder. Meanwhile, the remainder of the Jews who were in the king's provinces also assembled to protect themselves and get relief from their enemies. They killed 75,000 of them, but did not lay their hands on the plunder. This happened on the 13th day of the month of Adar, and on the 14th they rested and made, a, made it a day of feasting and joy. The Jews in Susa, however, had assembled on the 13th and 14th, and then on the 15th they rested and made it a day of feasting and joy. That is why rural Jews, those living in villages, observe the 14th of the month of Adar as the day of joy and feasting, a day for giving presents to each other. Amen. May God bless the reading of his word to us. I've stopped there for now. You go and read the rest. The rest is just a celebration of what has happened and what God has done. Now, I'm sure you all recall moments when you were arguing either with your siblings or with your mother while your dad was sitting on the lazy boy or on the couch, seemingly unperturbed by what is going on around him. And then you say or do something that just goes a bit over the top. Something that just pushes the boundaries a bit too far. And in one smooth, swift moment, your dad would arise out of that chair. And you would instantly know, he komadang. It doesn't matter how fast you are or how clever you are. Let me tell you, my dad with his short little legs could outrun me if he needed to. You knew there was no way out. He had been silently, uh, been a silent witness up until this point. But now you might as well find a stone and carve out your own inscription. Here lies Walter. He was a fool, so his dad clapped him. And here we see how God turns the tables. It's almost as if God drops the mic. In some other households, he would say, oh, my beer. <laughs> you see, God stands up and he says, enough is enough. The tables have been turned. Haman's decree is reversed. God's people have seen their God come through for them. We see how God gives his people five specific things in the passage that I read this morning. And these five things are for us too. As God's children, we stand in line and God gives us these things at the right time and for the right reasons. The first thing that we see that God gives his people is victory to victim. Victory to the victims. The Jewish people were to be killed on this day. But instead, the Jews had been given permission to destroy their enemies. But just look at the support that they had garnered. Even the satraps, the nobles, the governors, and the king's administrators, and let's just think about a few chapters ahead, weren't they all supporters of Haman? Weren't they all ones who went with what Haman said? All the noble satrap governors and king's administrators helped the Jews because they were afraid of Mordecai. A few chapters back, who was Mordecai? The man in sackcloth, lying outside of the, the king's gates. He was a nothing. He was a Jew. And now all the people in prominent positions are afraid of this nothing. This nobody. This one who could do nothing, who had no power, who is meant to be killed today. They were afraid of him and supported God's people. 
It also said there were other people from other nationalities who stood with the Jews and supported and helped them because they were afraid. Now, one of the greatest problems we have as believers in this day is that we think we are victims. We think we are victims. We walk around with this victim mentality. Everything is going wrong with me. Why are things always going their way and not my way? Why is this always happening to me? Why do I have to struggle? Why is there more month than money in my month? And for them, they are still partying the day before payday. How how does that work? Why do I have to have issues why are my children struggling with drugs why do my children have to face these issues why is there issues in my marriage why are my brothers and sisters always going against me always fighting against me always wanting their way we have this victim mentality and we are reminded this morning that god has given victory to those who were victims christians We have victory through Jesus Christ. We have the upper hand over our enemy. We have been made victorious through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Can I have an amen? Amen. You see, God has given us victory. We don't have to walk around feeling inferior like the Jews did in chapter 2, where where Esther didn't even want her name to be known, didn't want to have a history, a background to be known, because of this fear, because she is a victim. And now at the end, last week we said that she said, my people, my family, She aligned herself with the people because she realized that God was going to make her victorious. Secondly, God gives assurance to the afraid. God gives the assurance to the afraid. Now the Jewish people had been living in fear, and rightly so. Yeah, you've got a a, a decree hanging over your head that you are going to be killed on this specific day. They had no idea what would happen to them or when it would happen or how it would happen. Life was very uncertain. And now everything was opposite. The very people that had caused them to be afraid are now afraid of them. The very people who were afraid, who were fearful, were standing in the ready position with swords and armed and ready to defend themselves. You may find this hard to believe, but through the power of Jesus Christ, the enemy is afraid of us. James verses 4 James chapter 4 verse 7 to 10 says this, Submit yourself then to God. Resist the devil and he will he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. You see, When we resist the devil, he will flee. He will try. He will try his way. He's going to try and break you down. But if you keep on resisting him, he's going to give up and say, this is a waste of time. God's got him. God's got her. God's got this situation. So what is the point in me even trying? You see, you resist the devil and he will flee from you. As children of God, we have absolutely no reason to be afraid because God has given assurance to us. Thirdly, God gives restoration to the ruined. Restoration to the ruined. Haman had all but ruined the lives of the Jewish people. 
He had almost succeeded in what his ancestors, the, the Amalekites, had tried to do. And that was to annihilate the Jews. Instead, we see here yeah, that it was the Amalekites that were ended. The Jews also followed the Lord's commands that had been given to King Saul many, many years ago to destroy everything. And that is why we see in this passage mentioned more than once that they did not take the plunder. They did not take what belonged to the Amalekites. They did not want to associate with anything that belonged to them. You see, God had restored his people. Now the enemy might convince you that your life is ruined, that it's over. The enemy might say to you, your history disqualifies you for a future. But let me tell you something, God can restore your life. No matter what you have done, no matter what you have thought, no matter what you have said, no matter what your desires have been, no matter if it has been evil, something that you have done or something small that you have done, it doesn't matter. My God, who has restored my life and transformed my history to a future inheritance with him, can do the same for you. Have you ever felt that God can't use you? There was a time in my life when I felt that because of my past, because of the things that I did. I thought that God can't use me. I thought that God was punishing me. I thought that God didn't want to bless me with a child because of my past. But God restored me. God spoke so clearly to me and said that your past cannot disqualify what I have in store for your future. So let me tell you this morning, if you have a history that you are not proud of, you can turn your back on it because your history is exactly what that word means. History. It's in the past. It doesn't define your future. And let me tell you something, the things that I did in the past, God has used those things, or at least the memory of those things, so that I could use it as a test me in the mission field. So that I could use my past as a test me, speaking to young boys, young girls, married couples, newly married couples. God has used my past to bring glory to his name in the present. So don't ever break yourself down and, and say that God can't use me. Or even say that God can't use me because I've only got a standard three. Or oh, God can't use me because I'm not very good at speaking. I can't remember verses. I can't quote verses. Why do you think God blessed me with an elder who remembers and quotes verses? Because I don't. That's why I always look back here. He'll be back next week, Sunday. I saw him in the week. He's coming back on Sunday after his month off. So he'll be back. So on Sunday, remind me to point to him and ask him to quote me something. <laughs> but God can use you, no matter how small you think you are, no matter how insignificant you think you are, God can use you. God can restore you. I love watching those shows where they they, they renovate homes and those kind of things. But there's also one where this one guy, I think it was on Facebook, where he takes old furniture that really looks like one more cheek is going to make that chair break. And I'm not talking about these cheeks. He takes that furniture and when he has finished with the restoration project, you would think that that is brand new. But it's not like the, the, the furniture that is crafted by machine these days, where after a week you see the things already sagging. That furniture is made to last. You see, that broken piece of firewood has been restored 
and crafted to be something that will last a lifetime, something beautiful, something with purpose. You see, God can take us and restore us from something that we think is insignificant. He has never thought that. We have put that on ourselves. We have allowed other people to speak that into our lives. He will restore your insignificance and make you to something usable and useful for his kingdom. See, God will restore you. Don't ever put yourself down. Fourth thing, God gives security to the insecure. Now, it doesn't matter how much I googled, I couldn't find a word that also matched and started with S. So, forgive me. God gives security to the insecure. You see, Esther asking for another day was to ensure that the enemy was completely defeated. And it's strange that Esther didn't come asking this time. The king came offering. The king says, what else do you want? What do you require? And she asks for another day so that the enemy, the Amalekites, can be put to death once and for all. A command that was given to the Israelites centuries, generations before, and they ignored it. They left some of the Amalekites alive. And Esther said, now it's done. We need one more day so that we can put the enemy to death. The hanging of Haman's ten sons. Remember, they were dead already. So why hang them if they're already dead? You can't kill them twice. But this was an outwardly expression to the people that the enemy is done. The enemy has been defeated. It was a visual reminder to the people that the Amalekites are no longer Amalekites. They are done for. They are defeated. The enemy is done for. You know, as believers, we are secure through our faith in the Holy Spirit. We have been sealed. We need to understand that we belong to God and He will take care of us. I love that psalm that describes us as resting and sheltered in the palm of his hand. We are kept safe. John chapter 10 verse 27 to verse 30. And I want to read this from the Passion Translation. It says this. My own sheep will hear my voice and I know each one. And they will follow me. I give to them the gift of eternal life And they will never be lost. And no one has the power to snatch them out of my hands. Verse 29. My father who has given them to me as his gift is the mightiest of them all. And no one has the power to snatch them from my father's care. The father and I are one. You see, when God secures us when he redeems us when he rescues us he places us in the palm of his hands and i don't care if security face or fence or expander or if what is the other one shutter trailer door i don't care what their advert says and what they show even when that ball comes crashing towards the safety gate But there's no safer place than the palm of God's hand. There's no safer place than being in the hand of the one who has rescued you and who will secure you. You see this, our salvation is secure in him. Nothing and no one can snatch us from his hand. Lastly, I want to end off with this. God gives Praise to the persecuted. The people went from being persecuted to praising. From being persecuted to celebrating. They were resting, celebrating, and giving one another gifts. 
It was a time of celebration and thanksgiving. You see, celebration and thanksgiving go hand in hand. As we celebrate together, we do so giving thanks to the one who has made all of this possible. And so all of the Jews were gathering together on the 14th and on the 15th day of Adar. And they were celebrating God's faithfulness to them. And they celebrated together by giving gifts to each other, by sharing a meal together, by honoring God, and by giving glory to God. And this still continues this very day. On the 13th and 14th month, day of Adar, the Jews still celebrate. I think Adar, the 12th month, is March. March, eh? Yes. And so you'll find that they still celebrate and honor God on those days because God has always proven to be faithful. That is why we come at the end of the year to celebrate and give thanks to God for His goodness and faithfulness in seeing us through this year. That is why when I stand in front of the church and make a request that I would like for us to collect 12 by 12, it's not so that I can keep, it's not so that we as a church can keep. Throughout this year, you have given generously for causes and needs that we had in the church and we used it for those things. But we want to have 12 by 12 so that we can show God's generosity. To those who are in need. In fact, I want us to do what the Jews did on the 13th and the 14th. I want us to celebrate together as we open up our Thanksgiving month next week by sharing a meal with each other. I want us to gather together next week after our service at 12 o'clock. And I want us to share a meal together, kicking off our Thanksgiving month, celebrating together with each other what God has done. And so I want to suggest that next week we come with meals prepared. You can go home and bring your meal back at 12 o'clock. We want to sit together around tables. We want to share our meals together and thank God for what he has done for us in this year. We want to celebrate God's goodness to us. And I think that would be the best way, an awesome way, to start off or to enter November by giving thanks and celebrating together. So I do want to invite you to come next week Sunday with a meal prepared. We've got enough microwaves and ovens to keep your food warm and to make it warm and to prepare it you can go home and fetch your meal bring your family with bring your friends along so we can celebrate together so we can honor god you know it's around a table that god that jesus always gathered with his people with his disciples was around a table like this that he gathered and we all know what happens around a table well, we know specifically what happens around a Baptist table. There's a lot of talking and a lot of eating. But this is a sweet time. It's a sweet time of fellowship. And I would really be blessed if we can all gather together next week to do that. I want to end by saying this. Just when your life seems to be at rock bottom... God can change it. Just when it seems that your life is at rock bottom, God can change it. Change it. I want to end of this morning's message by reading chapter 10. I'm going to read the whole chapter, all three verses. King Xerxes imposed tribute throughout the empire to its distant shores. Listen to this. Remember the word rock bottom. 
and all his acts of power and might together with a full account of the greatness of Mordecai whom the king had promoted are they not written in the book of the annals of the kings of Media and Persia Mordecai the Jew who was rock bottom became second in rank to King Xerxes preeminent among the Jews and held in high esteem by his many fellow Jews because he worked for the good of his people and spoke up for the welfare of all the Jews you see Mordecai a few chapters ago was at a rock bottom and just look what God did for him is Mordecai any different to us is Mordecai any specialer than us no we are all the same in God's sight and so if you find yourself being at rock bottom right now if you feel that you are rock bottom do you know what you do how do we normally celebrate we shake that bottom <laughs> don't record that <laughs> if you feel that you are at rock bottom now Place your trust in God because He will elevate you. He will lift you up like He did with Mordecai and put you in a place where you can say, But God, it is only because of God that I am here. You see, God has given not just Mordecai, not just Esther and the Jews, but God has given every single one of his sons and daughters. He has given us victory. He has given us assurance. He has given us restoration and security. And what do we give him? Let us give him praise. Let us give him praise because he has been faithful he has been good to us great is thy faithfulness O God my father father great is thy faithfulness morning by morning new mercies I see all I have needed thy hand has provided great is thy faithfulness Lord unto me this morning as we partake around the communion table, I want us to remember God's faithfulness and goodness to us. And be reminded that God has made us victorious in Him and through Him. I'm going to invite our deacons to come to the front to assist me this morning as we serve you. as we gather around the table.